Hello folks, this is your instructor, Nick Andre, welcoming you back to another screencast. In this screencast, we will explore addressing, a key function of any network layer protocol. We will examine in detail the structure of IPv4 addresses and their applications to the construction and testing of IP networks and subnetworks. Before we begin this adventure, let's take a step back and re-explore what we've discovered. The application layer acts as an interface between the user and their respective networks. The presentation layer handles any necessary translations, compressions, and encryptions required for the conversation. The transport layer takes the conversation and breaks the message into smaller pieces called segments. These segments are then carried by a network layer protocol like IP to their final destination. For communication to take place between hosts, the appropriate addresses must be applied to these devices. Managing the addressing of the devices and understanding the IPv4 address structure and its representation are essential. Each device on a network must be uniquely identified by a network layer addressing scheme. The autonomy of a network layer address is governed by an addressing protocol like IPv4. In the case of IPv4, a host is identified by using 32 bits. These addresses are stored as binary patterns so devices are able to interpret them using digital logic. Unfortunately, a string of 32 bits makes it hard to remember, write, or verbally communicate, hence the need for the dotted decimal notation. Representing IPv4 addresses as dotted decimal notation begins by separating the 32 bits of the address into bytes. Each byte of the binary pattern, called an octet, is separated with a dot. The bytes are then converted into a decimal number. We will discuss how to convert a binary number into decimal in another screencast. In this example, the IP address would be read as 172.16.4.20. The high order or significant bits, the bits that make up the 172.16, represent the network portion of this IP address. A network is defined as a group of hosts that have identical bit patterns in the network portion of their addresses. Both examples belong to the same network because they both share the same significant bits. The rest of the bits denote the host side of the address. These bits can be used to determine the network size. Other than grouping hosts into the same broadcast domain, the network address, as learned in Chapter 5's reading, is used by routers to forward packets on. Since a network can vary in length, a router accomplishes the task of routing by using the subnet mask. The subnet mask is a 32-bit value. When anded with an IP address, will mask the host portion to reveal the network part of the address. A network prefix and a subnet mask are one of the same. They are both used to inform users and or devices where the boundary between the network portion and the host must be drawn. Instead of writing out the entire dotted decimal notation of the host mass, a network administrator can use the network prefix as shorthand. In this case, our subnet mask is 255.255.0.0. That is the same as saying the network prefix is a slash 16. This indicates that the first 16 bits of the address represent the network portion. I prefer to use the network prefix over the subnet mask, as it is easier to verbally communicate and makes better binary sense. At the time of development, all IP addresses were designed to be classful, i.e., there was no subnet mask to separate the network and host portion of an address. To distinguish between the two, a device would examine the high order bits of an address to determine what class the host belonged to. The class structure would inform the device what octets are used to represent the network portion and the host part. It's important to note that classful addresses used complete octets to represent each portion of an address. That is to say, an octet never contained both parts. It would either store the network or host part, but not both. According to our table, a class A address would be identified by a binary zero in the leftmost place, aka the highest bit. B would contain a binary one followed by a zero for its high order bits, and a class C would begin with two binary ones followed by a zero. 
Let's see how a router extracts a network address using classful techniques. First, a packet destined to host 16.10.120.1 comes in. This address is written in dotted decimal notation. We need to change views to better understand this process. Now that this number is in binary, the router will use the high order bits of this address to determine the host class. It determines that this packet is destined to a host on class A network. Using our class table, the router is informed that the first octet represents the network address and the last three represent the host. That is to say the destination network address for this packet is 16.0.0.0. And the router can begin the process of finding a route for this packet now that it knows its network address for the destination. Classful allocation of an address space often wastes many addresses, which exhausted the availability of IPv4 addresses. For example, a company that had a network with only 260 hosts would need to be given a Class B address with more than 65,500 addresses. When assigning a company a Classful address, no two companies can have the same network address. All host addresses were allocated to that one particular company. In this example, all 65,500 addresses were given to the company even though all they needed was 260 addresses, wasting just over 65,274 host addresses. The system that is currently in use is referred to as classless addressing. With classless system, Address blocks are assigned to companies or organizations by the number of hosts needed for their network. This new system would introduce the need for a subnet mask, which makes IPv4 more practical and allows administrators to minimize waste when assigning blocks of addresses. On a later slide, we will discuss how addresses are assigned and how devices use the subnet mask to extract the network portion from an IP address. Other than network address, an IP address can be used to serve many different purposes and represent other forms of communication. There are four forms of IP addressing, each with its own unique properties. Unicasting, broadcasting, multicasting, and anycasting. We will explore the first three forms in this section of IPv4 addressing. The most common form of communication is known as unicasting and it occurs when a single host wants to communicate with another host. To accomplish this, the sender will address the receiver by placing the receiver's IP address into the packet's destination field. To communicate with a group of hosts, the sender must use a special address. Depending on the audience, the sender could use a broadcast address or a multicast address to send a packet to multiple users. The process of broadcasting happens when a single host sends a packet to all hosts on a network. To do this, the sender will place the network's broadcast address in the destination field of the packet's header. A network's broadcast address consists of all binary ones in the host portion of the IP address. That is to say, the highest address of a network is reserved for limited broadcasting. We call this limited broadcasting because the router will not forward this broadcast onto other networks. Hence, it's limited to a broadcast domain, i.e., a network. To direct a broadcast to non-local devices, the sender must set the destination address to the global address of 255.255.255.255. .255 .255. Routers can be configured to pass this broadcast along. Typically, broadcasting is used for the location of devices whose addresses are unknown or a host that has a need to communicate with multiple devices. Multicasting discussions occur when one host sends packets to a select group of interested receivers that may or may not be a part of the same logical network. IP multicasting is widely deployed in multimedia content delivery networks to significantly lower bandwidth usage by allowing a host to send packets to multiple receivers. To subscribe to a multicast group, the clients must use a service 
and or program assigned to a special class D IP address. I guess you can think of multicasting as assigning special services an IP address. Since services are being assigned addresses, the Internet Assigned Number Authority will help to regulate this address block. Within each network, there are two addresses that cannot be assigned to devices, the network address and the broadcast address. The other addresses allocated to a network are the host. The network address is a standard way to refer to a network. Unlike the network address, the broadcast address is used in communication to all hosts in a network. As described previously, every end device requires a unique unicast address to deliver a packet. Special addresses can also be assigned to host, but with restrictions on how these hosts can interact within the network. The default route, as we learned from Chapter 5, is a catch-all route to route packets when a router cannot find a better match. This entry uses the entire 0.x.x.x address block. Hence, the reason why a Class A starts at 1 and not 0. Class A also ends at 126 and not 127. That is because the 127 block is reserved for the loopback. The loopback address is a special address that hosts use to direct traffic to themselves. You can ping the loopback address of 127.0.0.1 to test the TCP slash IP stack. It is also very useful for servers to access multiple services running on the same machine without accessing the lower layers. The link local addresses are automatically assigned to the local host by the operating system in environments where no IP configuration is available. You may have noticed that this address block before when your computer boots up and your network interface card was left unplugged. Since the machine wasn't manually configured and has no means of accessing a DHCP server, the OS had to assign it a number, hence a 169.254.something.something. Last block of addresses are set aside for teaching and learning purposes. I rarely ever use the testnet address block in my examples. To summarize and simplify this section, there are many different types of IPv4 addresses, and each have their own special purpose. A typical network consists of three types of addresses, a network, broadcast, and host address. A network address, the lowest address in a network block, is used to identify a group of hosts and is used by routers to determine routes. A broadcast address consists of all binary ones in the host portion of an IP address. Hence, it is the highest address in the network, and it is used to send messages to everyone on the same logical network. The values between the network and broadcast address are the unicast range, assigned to end devices used to uniquely identify each host. For communication to take place between hosts, the appropriate addresses must be applied to these devices. To prevent duplication of addresses, a network administrator should plan and document address allocations. In this section, we will explore best practice and methods for addressing hosts on a network. Keep in mind, there are many aspects of address planning and many different ways to allocate addresses. This section will only offer advice for planning and documentation, as well as considerations for assigning private addresses within a network. When it comes to planning, I'm always reminded of the classic military adage known as the seven P's. Proper planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. With a properly planned and documented network, an administrator can identify a device and or user on the network that is being problematic and implement some form of control. In the case of address duplication, the administrator may implement a layer seven service known as DHCP to assign IP addresses to their network's end device. Without DHCP or documentation, it is very easy to assign an address to more than one host on the same network. As we well know, 
duplicated IP addresses will prevent devices from communicating across the network. Hence, the reason why each host on a network must have a unique address. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol is a great service to use when it comes to assigning end devices an IP address. However, not all devices should be assigned a random address, such as the case for servers and intermediary devices. If a server has a randomly assigned address, controlling access to and or finding this address is difficult and would require administrators to update their security rules as well as inform clients each time their server was assigned a new address. To prevent this problem, we allocate a block of addresses used by a manager to manually assign addresses to these devices. When determining the addresses to be assigned within the network, similar devices should be grouped into address ranges. An address range, or a logical block of addresses within a network, could be used to describe different types of devices, such as end devices, servers, and intermediary devices. Hosts assigned to these blocks can be configured to receive an IP address statically or dynamically. The decision whether to use static or dynamic assignment for a particular device type depends on several factors. In most networks, end devices for users represent the largest number of devices. Consequently, the largest logical block should be allocated to these hosts. Because of the challenges associated with static address management, end user devices often have addresses dynamically assigned using DHCP. As with all devices on a network that provide resources, like servers, the IPv4 addresses for these devices should be static since clients use IP addresses to access them. Predictable or statically assigned addresses make it easier to identify these devices when implementing access control or monitoring network traffic. A device designated to serve resources to the public must have a public space address associated with it to make it accessible by the internet. Almost all traffic within or between networks pass through some form of intermediary devices. Therefore, these network devices provide an opportune location for network management, monitoring, and security, hence the need to assign these devices manually. In this example, we can see how a network administrator arranged their devices and signed each group a block of IP addresses. They decided to group the devices into four groups, user host, servers, peripherals, and networking devices. Each of these device types is assigned to a group of addresses inside network 172.16.x.0. According to the network prefix, this network can handle 254 hosts. The first section contains 128 addresses. The next section contains half that, and the last two sections each can handle 32 hosts. Each summary address per group is shown in the last column. You will learn more about the summary addresses in later courses. For now, a single rule can be created using a summary address rather than individual rules for the address of each device. This allows the device to have fewer security rules, which greatly streamlines the security function. Without a network address translation service installed on a perimeter device, Packets addressed with a private source or destination address should not appear on public networks like the Internet. In other words, private addresses are blocked from public access by routers. Hence, many hosts in different networks can use the same private address. In order for a host to be part of a private network, it must belong to either the 10.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 the 0, .0 or the 192.168.0.0 address block. For this reason, you should be familiar with the ranges of each network provided on this slide. Because packets with private space destination addresses are not routable across the internet, services to translate packets from hosts using private addresses are required. These services, called Network Address Translation, or NAT, can be implemented on the device at the edge of the private network. NAT, in a nutshell, changes the private space addresses in the packet header to a public space address by borrowing a public address. 
these hosts in a private network can communicate to outside networks. To work with IPv4 networks, you need to be able to develop and determine proper addressing. These skills include the ability to determine whether a particular host is on a network, determine the addresses in a particular network, and determine how to divide an addressing scheme for an inner network. As a network associate, one of the determinations you often have to make about a host is, is it on my network? Or, to what network does this host belong? To make these determinations, we must first convert the dotted decimal notation of our IP address into binary. In this example, we're given a host address of 192.168.0 35. To begin this, we must first separate the IP address into four groups. Now that the IP address is broken into four parts, we can convert each separately. To aid in this process, I created a table with the place values already established. To convert 192 into binary, I asked myself which one of the place values comes the closest to 192 without going over it. I will place a 1 under the 128th place since 128 is the closest value to 192. I will now remove this place value from 192 and repeat the process. Now I will ask myself which one of the place values comes the closest to 64. I will place a 1 under the 64th place since 64 equals to this value. I will also place zeros under the other places. As a result, 192 decimal is 11000000. In binary, in this demonstration, I will place this value in the blue cells under 192. I will repeat this whole process over again with the next octet until all octets are converted. In the interest of saving time, I took the liberty of converting the rest of the numbers on my own. For more practice and better examples, visit my YouTube channel. Before we can determine the network address of our host, we must first decide whether or not our address is classless. If it is not, then we can follow the rules of classful addressing and match the first octet with an entry in our classful table and see that this host would belong to the 192.168.1.0 network. In this particular case, we are provided with a network prefix and can assume we are dealing with a classless address. A network prefix, remember, informs the administrator the number of bits used for the network address. Hence, the slash 27 tells us the first 27 ones make up the network portion of the address. To illustrate this, I placed 27 binary ones from left to right under the host address. I also converted these binary numbers back in the decimal to show you what the user would enter to configure their end device. Using this binary subnet mask, in digital anding operation, we can extract a network address from an IP address. This is how we accomplish it. Using the provided truth table, if an IP bit is a 1 and the masking bit is also a 1, I will write down a 1. This will be the only time in which the results would yield a 1. So a 1 and a 1 is a 1, and a 1 and a 1 is a 1. A 0 and a 1 is 0. A 0 and a 1 is 0. 0 and 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 1 is 0. I will continue to do this for the rest of the bits. Once again, I took the liberty to convert these new binary digits into decimal for us to better understand what network this host really belongs to. A video on converting binary numbers into decimal numbers can be found on my YouTube channel. I would recommend watching this video. 
For now, we can see that this host belongs to the 192.168.1.32 network and not the classful network of 192.168.1.0. Another way of saying this would be network 192.168.1.32 is a subnet for the larger network of 192.168.1.0. We will discuss this in more details on another screencast. Next, you should calculate the lowest host address. This address is always one greater than the network address. Therefore, using binary counting, you can increment the ones bit, making the last host bit a one. Like before, I would convert this new binary number back in the decimal so I can better understand it. In this example, I will focus on the fourth octet, as this was the only octet that will experience change. Using the table I created before, I will place the binary digits in the fourth octet remembering to keep order. I will then multiply the place values with these binary digits and add these decimal numbers together. After converting the binary numbers back in the decimal, we can see that the first usable address for this network is 192.168.1.32 to determine the highest host address, make the lowest host bit a 0 and all other host bits a 1. As indicated, the host parts are in orange, hence I change only those bits to be all 1's and the lowest bit a 0. This would yield a 192.168.1.62 as my last usable address for this network. The broadcast address of a network is always the highest address in the address block. It requires that all the host bits be set to all ones. Therefore, all five host bits used in this example are set to ones, producing a broadcast address of 192.168.1.63. Finally, you need to determine the host range for this network. The host range of the network includes all the addresses from the lowest host address to the highest address. Therefore, in this network, the address range is 192.168.1.33 to 192.168.1.2. This range is commonly referred to as the signable address range because this is where we assign our host addresses their unique IP address. Sometimes it helps to organize the results of your work into a single table to help see the block of addresses designated for the network and the related subnets. So far, we have done the work for one subnet whose network address is 192.168.1.32. Another IPv4 addressing skill that's helpful for a network associate is the ability to plan the subnet of a network. Subnetting allows creating multiple logical networks from a single address block. It's simple to create subnets. All one has to do is borrow bits from the host. For each bit borrowed, the total number of subnets double. Since these bits are stolen from the host, the number of usable hosts per subnet is reduced. Additionally, because you have two addresses for each network, the network address and the broadcast address, that cannot be assigned to host, the total number of hosts in the entire network decreases as the more subnets you create. To better understand subnetting, let's work with the following problem. We're given an address block of 192.168.1.0. We have a prefix of a slash 24, and we want to create two subnets. In order to create two subnets, we will borrow one bit from the host portion by using a subnet mask of 
255.125.128 instead of the original 255.255.255.0. This makes the most significant bit in the last octet a network bit instead of a host bit. We will use this bit to distinguish between the two subnets. For one of the subnets, this bit will be a 0. And for the other subnet, this bit will be a 1. Using the 2 raised to the nth power formula, where n is the number of bits either borrowed or left over, we can calculate the number of subnets and the total number of hosts each subnet can handle. Since we borrowed one bit, 2 raised to 1 would yield 2 subnets. For each subnet, we can examine the last octet of the address in binary to determine their network address. All binary zeros would yield a decimal 0, hence subnet 0 has a network address of 192.168.1.0. A binary 1 in the 128th place and all zeros afterwards would yield a decimal of 128. Hence, subnet 1 has a network address of 192.168.1.128. Using that same formula, we can calculate the total number of hosts each subnet can handle. To do this, we must first count the number of bits left over after borrowing. These are our host bits. Since we have seven host bits left over, we can take two and raise it to the seventh power, which yields us a total of 128 hosts. This 128 represents the total addresses per subnet. We can remove the network address and the broadcast address from this range to yield 126 usable host addresses. This range will become our signable address block. This first subnet, subnet 0, will start at 192.168.1.1 and end at 192.168.1.126. Subnet 1, the second subnet, will begin at 192.168.1 dot 129 and finish at 192.168.1.254. By borrowing a bit, we were able to create two networks, each with 126 usable host addresses within the same address block. This technique is known as fixed width subnetting. Beginning with the previous example, consider an internet work that requires three subnets. Borrowing a single bit would only provide two subnets. To provide more networks, you need to borrow more bits. Ask yourself, 2 raised to what power will be able to accommodate three subnets? Well, 2 raised to 1 gives us two subnets, which is not enough. Let's see, 2 raised to 2 would give us four subnets, which is more than enough. Since bits cannot be split in half, two bits will have to do. Although I only need three subnets, the closest I can get is four. Hence, borrowing two bits from the host would change my subnet mask to 255.255.255.192 and would yield 62 usable host addresses per subnet. The subnet mask is determined by the number of bits used to represent the network address. In this example, I began with the original 24 bits and I borrowed two more bits from the host, resulting in a total of 26 bits for the network portion of my address. I will take these 26 bits and regroup them in groups of 8. Each group represents an octet. The last octet will only contain two binary ones. However, an octet must consist of 8 bits, so I will pad the rest of the places with zeros. Now that I have four groups of eight bits, I can convert each group or octet back into decimal. All binary ones produce decimal of 255. Hence, the first three octets of my subnet mask will be 255. The last octet contains a one in the 128th and a one in the 64th place. All zeros afterwards. 
which yielding a 128 plus a 64, giving me a decimal of 192. After a few of these conversions are done, my subnet mask will be 255.255.255.192. Since I am working with a fixed width subnetting, this will be the same subnet for the other three subnets. When subnetting, consider the following. First, the total number of hosts required by the entire corporate inner network. This includes each end user device, servers, intermediary devices, and router interfaces. Be sure to also include the network and broadcast address per each network as well. You must use a block of addresses that is going to be large enough to accommodate all devices in all the corporate networks. In this example, we are given the 192.168.1.0 address block. The slash 24 indicates we have 8 bits, that is 32 bits minus 24, to address our total number of hosts. The next thing, consider the number of networks you will divide these hosts into. Remember factors of grouping when you divide these hosts into smaller groups. Geographical location, by purpose, or by ownership. In this case, we have six groups, each needing a subblock of addresses from the larger address block of 192.168.1.0/24. After they are grouped, start with the largest group and begin to divide your address block into portions, aka subnets. Continue until all groups have been assigned a subnet. Subnet 0 will contain our largest group. The next group will be assigned to subnet 1. Subnet 2 contains the last local area network. Our WANs will be assigned subnet 3, 4, and 5. It looks like we have extra host bits to play around with later. The largest group will set the block size used by the other subnets. In our example, we will need six host bits to accommodate our largest group. Since this group will need six host bits and the block we were assigned has a total of eight bits, we are left with two bits to use for subnetting. Unfortunately, borrowing two bits from the host portion will only produce four subnets, which is not enough to accommodate this example. I could try to borrow three bits from the host, which would give me enough bits for my subnets, but not enough to accommodate my largest group. When identifying the total number of hosts using traditional subnetting, you allocate the same number of addresses for each subnet. If all the subnets have the same requirements for the number of hosts, these fixed size address blocks would be efficient. However, that is not the case most of the time. Using fixed width subnetting for this example is not only inefficient, but also unfeasible. Hence, the need for variable length subnet mask. VLSM for short was designed to maximize addressing efficiency by allowing administrators to subnet subnets. Just like before, start with the largest group to set the partition size. Our largest group requires six host bits, hence each partition will have a fixed width of 64 total host addresses. This table shows us the range of each partition and the number of partitions our original address block can handle. Notice each subnet address is 64 numbers away from the previous address. I will now assign the first subnet, subnet 0, to my largest group. After assigning this block, I will look at the next largest group. According to the table on the last slide, my next group requires a subnet size of 32. I could assign this group to the next subnet, subnet 1. In doing so, I would waste 32 addresses. To avoid this issue, I decide to implement VLSM and change the length of this subnet. Right now, this subnet has a prefix length of 26, and my next largest subnet needs 32 addresses. So I decide to borrow one more bit from the host portion. 
splitting this subnet into two subs. Subnets each with 32 host addresses. This technique will allow me to assign the next group to subnet 1.0. After assigning this group to subnet 1.0, I will proceed to the next largest group, 16 total host. Once again, I could assign this to subnet 2, but I would waste 48 host addresses. I could also assign this group to the newly formed 1.1 subnet, but I would be wasting an, an additional 16 host addresses. Since I am using VLSM, I will subnet subnet 1.1 again. Borrowing one more bit from the host, I will split subnet 1.1 into two equal subnets, each 16 host wide. I can assign my third group to the first newly formed subnet. Following the same process, I will divide subnet 1.1.1 into four equal parts to handle my point-to-point -point connections. The following table represents a single cohesive view of our six subnets. Notice that subnet 0 goes from 0 to dot 63 and it takes up that very first column and nothing to the right can be used because I'm using the range from 0 to 63. And if I look down below starting at 64 going all the way up to I would say about 127, I have another sort of series of subnets. And this is where the VLSM is coming in. The very first subnet, subnet 0, was used to address all 60 hosts for that one network. But subnet 1, even though it had room for another 64 host, did not need all 64 hosts. In fact, all we needed was about 32. So what I decided to do was I decided to split subnet 1 into two equal parts. That will allow me to go over to one column and you can see that under the slash 27 column subnet 1 starts at dot 64 and ends up at dot 95. That's 32 wide. The next box underneath it that would be subnet 2 if subnet 2 needed all 32 which in this case did not allow me to split that in half which allowed me to go to the next column to the right, the slash 128. So I took the original two subnets, divided it up to create two additional subnets. In this case, subnet 2 now starts at dot 96 and goes all the way up to 111 instead of 127. Now I look at the last empty box, if you will, and I decide to break that box up into four equal subnets for my point to point and that ends up at my last column the slash 30. Each time I divide my boxes if you will in half I reduce the number of hosts but I also increase the number of subnets. There are special utilities and verification cases for which you can use to test connectivity from end device to end device. In this last section of our screencast, we will learn how to use the ping utility to test IP connectivity between hosts. Ping sends out requests for response from a particular host. Pings use a layer 3 protocol that is part of the TCP slash IP suit called Internet Control Messaging Protocol or ICMP for short. If the host at the specified address receives the echo request, it responds with an ICMP echo reply. As each response is received, ping provides a display of time between each request. This helps to measure the network's performance. If a response is not received within a period of time, ping will give up and inform the user of this failure. Ping is a simple utility and if used correctly can help to narrow down serious problems. Troubleshooting is the process that first begins at a single host. Pinging the loopback helps determine if the internet protocol is properly installed on the host. The response from the loopback informs the technician that the interface drivers and protocols were properly installed on the local host. It does not indicate anything about the status of the stack's lower layers. Hence the need for step two. 
I will always ping myself by using the IP address of the device I am currently using to test the physical layers. If this test fails, then there might be something wrong with my interface, the medium, or the switch. To rule this out, I will ping a local device that I verified was working. In order for this ping to be successful, it has to travel out of my interface card, onto a medium, through an intermediary device, through another medium, into the other device's interface card, and back again. The key here, it has to make sure that the other device is working. If you have a successful connectivity between your device and the other local device, ping the local side of your gateway. If this fails, check to see if another device on your network is having the same problem. Let's say that both devices are having the same issue. In this case, I would focus my attention on the gateway. By checking configuration files, link lights, and cable conditions before moving on. If the other device was successful, I would then check the device I am having troubles with and verify that it is properly configured. In other words, I will check to see if both my devices and the gateway are on the same logical network. If all is well and I am able to ping the private side of my gateway, I will then ping its public side. This part will help to rule out the interface that connects my local area network to a wide area network. It will not verify any learned or statically configured routes stored on my gateway. We will use another utility for that. Assuming all the other steps have passed on both devices, whether they are local or remote, and you are still having problems, then you need to proceed to step 5. So far we ruled out the protocol stack, the interface cards, and local configuration issues. What we haven't ruled out was the intermediary devices responding from end to end, i.e. routers. By pinging a remote host, we are able to see if there is something wrong with our router's table, their interfaces, and our security rules that are affecting the communication process. Speaking of security rules, before performing any of these tests, make sure your local firewall is turned off. Sometimes they can get in the way of troubleshooting. So to recap this, you ping your local loopback to test the stack. Then you ping yourself by typing in your own IP address to rule out the lower layers. Third step, ping another device that's on the local network. Fourth, ping both the public and the local side of your gateway. And the fifth step is to ping another device on another network to rule out any intermediary issues. Ping is used to test the connectivity between two hosts, where the traceroute is a utility that allows you to observe the pathway the packets take between these two hosts. If the data reaches the destination, the trace lists the interface on every router in the path. If the data fails at some hop along the way, you will have the address of the last router that responded to the trace. This is an indication of where the problem or security restrictions are. Traceroute uses a function of the time to live field in the layer 3 header as well as the ICMP time exceeded message. The TTL field is used to limit the number of hops that a packet can cross. When a packet enters a router, the TTL field is decremented by 1. When the TTL reaches 0, a router will not forward the packet and the packet is dropped. It's important to mention that IPv6 is not merely a new layer 3 protocol. It's a new protocol suite. New protocols at various layers of the stack have been developed to support this new protocol. There's a new messaging protocol called ICMPv6, which means that we'll have a new ping command to support the new 128-bit address that's built into IPv6, as well as a new traceroute command to handle the extended address range and possibly the new features for authentication and encryption. Not only do we have a new ICMBP protocol, but we'll also have new routing protocols to support the new IPv6. 
Features of IPv6 include larger address space, simplified header format, and authentication with encryption. The primary reason for the development of IPv6 would be for its expanded addressing capabilities. This was a long screencast, so let me review what we discussed. IPv4 addresses are hierarchical. They contain networks, subnetworks, and host portions. An IPv4 address can represent a complete network. They can be used to represent individual hosts, or we can use broadcasts to communicate to many different devices on the same network. Different addresses are used for single communications, selected group communications, as well as broadcasting. Careful address planning is required to make the best use of the available address space. Size, location, use, and access requirements are all considerations in the address slash planning process. After it is implemented, an IP network needs to be tested to verify its connectivity and operational performance. Many tools such as the ping and traceroute can help us verify these connections. This was one very long screencast and I would like to thank you for your time and I plan on seeing you in the next screencast. Until then, follow along with the subnetting examples posted on my YouTube channel.